Father, we pray that you will be faithful to anoint the word of faith that we teach this evening to the hearts of your people, to every one of our hearts. For we know that faith is the basic concern of God, and that without it, it is impossible to please you. For you have revealed to us by the Spirit of God in your word those exceeding great and precious promises, and we only need to apply our faith to these promises to see them become a reality in our life. And so as we have gathered together here in thy name to hear the word, then we thank you that you are faithful to anoint your word, for faith cometh by hearing the word. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to continue in our series on faith this evening, coming to our third condition, and that condition being you must be willing to confess your faith. That is to say, you must be willing to confess that you believe that you have received prior to your ever seeing or feeling or realizing in the sense realm the thing for which you pray. Now, as we have seen before, Romans 14, 23, whatever we do or have or say in our lives that's apart from faith is sin, and I'm sure we'd all agree that sin displeases God. And in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, the Bible very clearly tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So you see, this is the basic concern of God. Contrary to what everyone else might be saying in the world today, we know that God is doing a quick work and he's going to cut it short in righteousness. He's restoring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's restoring New Testament apostolic ministry back to the body of Christ. But the thing that's going to make all of this work the thing that holds all of it together, the thing that will keep you alive long enough to see all of it come together is the end-time biblical message of faith. And so this is why we are concentrating here on these Wednesday night meetings on the subject of faith because it's the very life and heart of God himself. For we see in Genesis chapter 1 and Hebrews 11, 3, that the same type of faith we're commanded to have God himself demonstrated for us in Genesis 1 by creating all things, Hebrews 11, 3, out of nothing. And that's generally what you have most of the time, and you've got to use your faith to get something from that, and that's nothing. So don't be surprised if you have to start with nothing and get something from it. God had to do the very same thing. He started with nothing, and he's, he was able to get something from it. And you're going to have to do the same thing. You say, well, uh, I've got the promises. Well, that's simply the word of God, and he had the word of God, and that's what he spoke in Genesis 1, 3, when he said, let there be light. That's the word of God, just like he says in his word, let you be healed. Now, that's the same word. It's the same word of God. It's the same God. It's the same word. The first word was able to call into existence things that didn't exist prior to that, namely light. The second word is able to call into existence things that might not exist in your life, namely healing. And we put an emphasis upon healing, friends, because, and sickness, because, well, really for two reasons. First of all, because of the universality of sickness. I mean, everybody's sick all over the world today. Now, they're not all poor. A lot of them are rich. But everybody's sick. doesn't matter whether you're poor or you're rich. Everybody's sick sooner or later. So we have to emphasize that. Another reason why we have to emphasize the, the message of faith in the area of divine healing is because of the ironic situation that we find the denominational church of our day in today, and that is having a message and a doctrine of divine sickness rather than divine healing. And if you've ever been to your average denominational church, you know that's the doctrine they present. It's the doctrine of divine sickness, and it's certainly not the doctrine of divine healing. 
That's all I ever heard in my church, what God was not doing today. He's not healing anyone today. Oh, he might on occasion, but that's always on the doctor's operating table. That's always in the emergency room. And God on occasion will perform a miracle there, or if it happens to be perhaps a Catholic mystic, then he might work a miracle for them. He's not healing, he's not doing miracles, he's not raising the dead, he's not baptizing people in the Holy Spirit, no speaking in tongues, all I ever heard was what God is not doing today. And then I was surprised, and I have to admit I was surprised when I read Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus never changes. I mean, I came to the conclusion my church must have changed then. <laughs> If the Bible says Jesus never changes, somebody's changed because the Bible talks about nothing but divine healing rather than divine sickness. But uh, you know as well as I do, if you ask the average Christian, how are you today? Well, you just have to get smart enough not to ask that question. <laughs> I mean, you get a complete medical report up and down the ladder. How they, well, how are you today? Well. And, you know, you've got to spend five minutes there. And you just ask them the simple question, how are you today? And you get a, a complete medical report from them. And this shouldn't be, since we see in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, we're going to be looking at some of these things you can confess this evening. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. Now, they will believe the first half of this verse who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose doctor's medicine we are healed. And then they don't believe the second half of the verse. But you know, it's talking about the same individual, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The first half of the verse, you get your sins erased. That is, if you're willing to confess on him as your Lord and Savior, believe on him and confess him, the second half of the verse is talking about the same individual. By whose stripes ye were healed. I never heard that part of the verse. I heard the second part, that I could get saved, but I never heard this part. Psalm 103, we've got the same case here. A verse divided in half, and well, that's what they did, divide it in half, rather than keeping it in its entirety. Psalm 103 and verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquity? But then I never heard, Who healeth all thy diseases? Or if I ever did, you know what they always said? Well, he's talking about spiritual diseases there. He heals those spiritual things and sicknesses on your soul. <laughs> but what are we going to do when Jesus heals the cripple and the lame? Were they crippled spiritually or lame spiritually? Was Bartimaeus blind spiritually? No, he was blind physically and he got his healing. I have to go over to the Gospels if I want to understand, well, who healeth all by diseases? Well, how did he heal people then? I found out that he healed their physical diseases. And besides that, he already told us in the first part of the verse that he heals your spiritual diseases. I mean, that's your iniquity. Those of you, he already told us that. He's not going to go on and say, and to heal your spiritual diseases for the second time. <laughs> I mean, he already said that in the first part of the verse. Who healeth all thy spiritual diseases? And then he says in the second part of the verse, and who healeth all thy physical diseases? And I found out from experience, those that have a doctrine of divine sickness, they don't really believe in it. Because guess who's the first one to Dr. Smith's office as soon as they get sick? They don't believe in a doctrine of divine sickness. Oh, they preach it from the pulpit. And as soon as they hear us say, now God will heal you, no, God puts these things on us for his glory and for our benefit that we might grow through them. But then I find that they're the first ones to the doctor's office to get those things off of them. I mean, if it's a blessing from God, let's ask for two of them rather than one. I mean, that only makes sense. As a matter of fact, if that is true, then you are in direct violation to the Word of God to go and have that thing removed if God's the one that put it upon you. You are in direct violation to the revealed will of God if you think that's what His revealed will is. 
And worse than that, Jesus went about in three-fourths of his ministry disobeying the clearly revealed will of the Father because he went around doing what? Healing the sick throughout his ministry. Now, if God puts this on us as a blessing in disguise, no one ever believes such foolish notions. <laughs> if he puts that on us as a blessing in disguise, it must really be disguised for his glory, then we've got Jesus fighting against the will of the Father because Jesus is going around healing the sick, and as soon as he finishes healing them, the Father's coming along and putting another sickness back on them so that he can get glory and they can receive humility. But that doesn't give you humility. That, that genders ignorance in your life. And it came as a result of ignorance, and that is ignorance over the Word of God. Now, I hate to mention what he says in verses 4 and 5. They really get mad at that. Especially when it goes on through verse 4. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy? You see, a positive faith, friends, is built on the positive promises of the Word of God. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things? So <laughs> that thy youth... I mean, you have to apologize to read it in your average church. You shouldn't be able to eat the things that you eat who satisfy thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. And they're confessing their doubts on the word of God rather than confessing their faith. I mean, that's our subject tonight, confessing your faith, not confessing your doubts. And they'll confess how old they are and how bad things are going for them. And we've got here in the Word of God, and by the way, this is the Older Testament. I mean, the New is going to get gooder than this. And he says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. But you shouldn't have those carnal, physical things like that. Like we shared with you last time. You're in God's will, you're walking with him. Now, don't try to get anything from him if you're disobeying him. I'm talking about, and the Bible's talking about, when you meet all the conditions, and the conditions are you base your prayers and you base your life on the word of God. But if you're in fellowship with God, walking in his will, I've got news for you if you've never heard it before. He's not afraid to give you the desires of your heart. Now, someone will always come along and say, well, I'm afraid to ask for the desires of my heart. I may get something carnal. Well, just tell them, then get a new heart. That's what I did. Get a new heart, and you won't be asking for things carnal. Exodus 15 and verse 26. The last part of the verse, For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Exodus 23, 25. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. And you know, some people, and I was one of them, all you got to do is just point these verses out, and they're just ready to believe them right away. But some people... And I'd, be, I'd not be doing you a favor to tell you that everyone you went and told what I'm going to tell you tonight is going to believe what you say, because they're not. Regardless of how in need they are, do you know you can actually come to someone with dire need and present the positive promises of God to them, and they'll say you're a liar? And they're the ones that need them. And they will actually have the boldness, the audacity, the ignorance to say that those things aren't for today. And they're the ones that need it. And they're going to, you better believe they're going to try every way to get what they need today, even though those things aren't for today. They're going to try every way in the world to get those things, except the way that God tells us, and that is by faith. We looked at that in Matthew 8. We looked at that in Luke 5. It's in Matthew 15. It's in Mark 7. He always is saying to these people, Be it unto thee according to thy faith. Then is it be it unto thee according to my grace, because we know God's gracious, or be it unto thee according to thy need. We all have needs, or some of us have needs. I don't have any needs. Mine are met. Some people have needs. 
Be it unto thee according to thy need. Never says that. It's always be it unto thee according to thy faith. And you see, friends, God gives us the right in his word to confess the promises and to confess our faith based upon the promises. I mean, he gives us the right to say what he has said in his word. And after all, that's really what the word means, confession in the Greek. If you'll turn over now to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that little simple word that we use, confession, means to say the same thing as, or to agree with. And we see it used here in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and although he's speaking of salvation as the subject, these two verses contain a faith principle. That if you believe in your heart, that was the first condition, base your faith on the word of God. And then you are willing to confess with your mouth whatever your need might be. Then he said, confession brings possession. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto possession of whatever it is you're confessing. You see, here he happens to be talking about salvation. He goes on to say in verse 13, Whosoever to call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He happens to be talking about salvation, but we have in Romans 10, 9 to 10, a faith principle. Now, a warning here is needed. You can't get your confession before you believe. Notice that the belief comes before the confession in Romans 10, 9 and 10. You've got people running around confessing things that I'm talking about people that have just a smattering of truth on faith or confession or healing or whatever it might be in the area of charismatic truth that God's restoring back to his body based on the word. They have a smattering of that and they'll run around confessing things, but they've got an absence of belief for those things that should have preceded their confession. Now, this is why we began the series, or began our conditions for faith with that all-important and all-inclusive one to base your faith on the Word of God rather than beginning the conditions with the subject of confession. You've got to first of all have faith for the thing, Hebrews 11.1, 1, and you first of all have to have your faith grounded in a certain promise of God before you're going to go on and do what the second half of verse 10 says, and that says, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, by the way, we can go on down here in the same chapter <clears throat> because you see that the promises of God are the divine resources. We can go on down in verse 17 and see how we're going to get this faith that believeth unto righteousness or this, or this faith that believeth unto healing or faith that believeth unto anything, friends, whether it's wisdom, guidance you need in your life, whether it's something material, something physical, something spiritual you need, whatever it is, verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And if people don't understand what all he's getting across in verse 17, Namely, that all you have to do is sit and hear faith, and faith comes. You can go back up to verse 14, and we've got the same thing said in the end of verse 14. How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, we've said before here, if you'll simply be faithful here on these nights to hear the teachings, and you'll get the tapes and hear the tapes, and on the basis, on the basis of Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing what? Well, he said back up in verse 14. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Hearing a preacher preach. What is he going to preach? 
Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing. Hearing and preach on faith. I mean, it's so simple when you get all the things put together. You've got the ears. We've got the preacher. God's got the word. When you get all three together, then faith cometh. I mean, you've got to have the ears, the preacher, and the word. You get all three things together, and on the authority of the word of God, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh. I mean, I lock myself in my room, and I play the tapes over. I had one series, I wore the tapes out. Wouldn't even play anymore. I wore them out. But as I said, you wear the tapes out, you wear your doubt out. You wear the tapes out, you wear that disease and that devil out. That's bothering you. And I had people criticizing me, you know, you sound like a broken record talking about faith. And then I always said back to them, well, if there's one thing I'd like to get stuck on, it's stuck on faith. Because without it, you can't please God. And with it, Mark 9, 23, all things are possible unto you. Now, I didn't say that in Mark 9, 23. But you don't know how bad my problem is. Well, however bad your problem is, is included in Mark 9, 23. And all things are possible to him that believeth. Therefore, that includes everything, all things, whatsoever. Remember how we've gone over that before on all those faith verses. Matthew 21, 22. Mark 11, 24. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. John 16, 23, 24. John 14, 13 to 14. 1 John 3, 22. Now those happen to just be the faith principles. Then you go right down the line on healing. Exodus 15, 26, we looked at those. Exodus 23, 25, Psalm 103, 5, Psalm 107, 20, Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, Isaiah 53, 1 to 6, Matthew 8, 17, Acts 10, 38, on and on and on. And that just covers healing. Then you can go over to prosperity. 3 John in verse 2, Genesis 13 in verse 2. Some, well, we better not go on there. You can't get all those down that fast, can you? <laughs> well, I just said those so you'd buy this tape. <laughs> That's not the total truth. Well, we looked at Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 already, didn't we? But you see, you got to know what the Scripture is. I mean, how can you base your faith on something you don't know? Can't base your faith on what I know. Lord, I claim it based on what he knows. That won't ever work for you, not in 10,000 years. Or I base my faith on the testimony that she gave or that he gave, how God gave them a new car, how God saved their old lost relatives. That won't work either. Faith cometh not by hearing testimony, friends. Now, your faith can be encouraged and incited and excited to be released and to receive something from God. That's why we share some of these testimonies with you, to show you that God's not the God of the old dead Baptist church. The dead Baptist church has a doctrine of a dead God that's not doing anything today. We share those things with you so you see that uh, this isn't something that happened 2,000 years ago. He still heals the sick today. He still provides finances for people when they need them. He still saves relatives like we see him saving in both Old and New Testament. So that's why we share these things with you. But don't ever be deceived into thinking that your faith or my faith or anyone else's faith can be based on anyone else's knowledge of the word. It can't be based on a miracle. Faith not based on fasting. Faith not based on how good you might be. Faith not based on how much you pray. Faith not based on how much you know about the Bible. Faith is based on what you know that the Word of God has promised you as a son or as a daughter of God. I mean, you don't want to make this thing any more difficult than it is because it's not difficult in the first place. But you have to understand these principles and be able to Put these principles and these conditions to work in your life. Now, if you have seen here from Romans 10, 9 and 10, 
the very first thing that all of us got from God, that is our salvation, is based on what? Well, it's based on faith again, all over again here. And as we're told over in Matthew chapter 10, there's no salvation apart from a positive confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said in Matthew 10, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. And if you deny me before men, then I'll deny you before the Father. I mean opposite things, but both of them are true. And there's no salvation apart from a positive confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I feel that one reason why it's so difficult to teach in this area and get people from the denominations to believe in healing or prosperity or divine guidance or household salvation or anything else is because they've never met the conditions for even their salvation in the first place. And you can prove that to yourself, friends. How? Well, go in your average church and ask someone, are you saved? I mean, a simple question, are you saved? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I know that I'm saved. I mean, I hope that I am. Or they'd say, well, I'm in church, aren't I? Give you a hundred and other things, a hundred and other, a hundred and one other confessions, but never a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, pray for me, brother, that I'll hold out to the very end and won't apostatize before the end comes. Well, I'm really trying. I've tried hard to be saved this week. You just ask them, are you saved? They won't actually come out and say, yes, I know that I'm saved. But the Bible says without a positive confession of faith in Christ, then you have no salvation. You wonder why it's so hard to get them to make a positive confession of, of faith in Christ for healing? They've never done it for salvation. Why is it hard to get them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? They've never believed for their salvation in the first place. They've been raised in church. I mean, their parents and their grandparents were in the church. So they were born in the church, and they were just raised in the church, never realizing they had to themselves make a personal positive confession of faith in Christ. And you see what we have today is most people are confessing their doubts at their saved. Well, I don't know whether I'm saved or not. I hope that I'm saved. They're doing everything but what the Bible says, and that is to make a positive confession, not of your doubts or your hope, but of your faith that you are saved. Now, this same thing is true regarding divine healing. You have to be willing to make a positive confession based on the Word of God, based on Mark 11 and verse 24, and the principle we see there, that you believe that you have received before you feel it or before you see the answer manifested to your sight. Now, we have a good example of someone who didn't do this over in the end of John's Gospel that we want to turn to so that you won't do the same thing. That's in John chapter 20. And a character of the church is always called Doubting Thomas. Well, I guess he had good reason to. He ended up believing but he was a doubter to start with. John 20 and verse 26. <clears throat> because as soon as we teach something on <clears throat> your right as a Christian to confess the word of God, confess that you believe that you have received, and after all, that's what Mark 11:24 says, to believe that you have received, then you shall have it. And people right away will come up with the notion, well, isn't that dishonest? For me to say that I believe that I have received something when I don't have it yet. Well, Jesus gives us an answer in John 20 and verse 26. Through verse 29, is it dishonest <clears throat> to confess that you believe that you have received something before you see it? After eight days again, his disciples were within. This is now a week later. A Sunday later, Thomas wasn't with the ten the first time. So now you've got all eleven back together. And Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. 
Now, he had done this before back in verse 19, saying the same thing. Now, you wonder why he said the same thing. Well, if someone walks through your door, they'd need to say that to you to keep the hair on your neck down. That's probably repeats it twice here. But if I walk through your door, that's probably the first thing I'd say before you start rebuking me in Jesus' name. You think it's a spirit that passed into your room or something. Well, he said that over and Luke, they thought he was a spirit. <laughs> that's what he said over in Luke 24. He said, you were supposing I was a spirit, so we had to eat a fish and a bowl of honeycomb. <laughs> Quite a combination there. Then he said to Thomas, reach hither. You see, he pointed right to him because he knew he had been doubting all week long now. Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless. You know what faithless means? It means less any faith in your life. Be not faithless, but faithful, full of faith. Be believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. I mean, he got the message here. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, there is the basis for believing is seeing rather than seeing is believing. I mean, if you don't believe it ahead of time and willing to confess it ahead of time, then you're not going to get anything. That is, nothing from God by faith. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. See the same thing again on the subject of salvation. For the Whom having not seen, speaking of Christ in the end of verse 7, 1 Peter 1, 8 to 9. Ye love in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Now, if 1 Peter 1 8 can, be, can actually be true, where it says, In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, then you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, then why can't we say that even though you haven't seen your healing yet, you can still believe and yet rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory? You see, it works the same way. You've got to have the rejoicing. You've got to have the thanksgiving. You've got to have the confession come right along with the believing but it has to come before the manifestation of whatever it is that you are believing for, whatever it is you have claimed based on the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us that we walk not by, faith, not by sight, but by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet the church of our day is teaching everyone how to walk by sight, not by faith. That's what the medical profession is based upon. We will come back in three days and we'll see if you are any better or not. It's based on walking by sight. We will test you and see whether or not that lump has gone down under your arm. We'll x-ray and see whether everything is all right. I mean, you'll always hear them say, we're going to do such and such, and we're going to see whether everything is all right or not. I mean, have you ever walked in a doctor's office and he just said, be it unto thee according to thy faith? Be healed by faith. Well, <laughs> I mean, he would run out of business there. That's what I would do if I was a doctor so I could get out of that ungodly profession. I mean, you talk about preaching yourself out of, job, out of a job, that's how you do it. I mean, as soon as he walks in, ask him, are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Then walk by faith and not by sight and get out of here. Well, then there goes all your revenue for that day. I've heard of people that call themselves spirit-filled doctors. 
I mean, I've known some that call themselves spirit-filled doctors. But uh, it seems like I read over there in 1 Corinthians 3 that if you destroy any part of the temple of God, if he's talking about your body, he's going to destroy you. I mean, I wouldn't want to be a doctor and be responsible for amputating somebody's leg or arm. That's, that's in 1 Corinthians 3. They ought to read that. You destroy the temple of God, he's going to destroy you. Do we believe in Christian doctors? Well, we believe in them about as much as we believe in Christian magicians and Christian politicians. Just lump them all in the same category there. Oh, I'm not saying they, they have to get out within six months when they hear the truth. I'm saying they've got to get out immediately as soon as they hear the truth. I wouldn't even give them six months. But oh, there goes my $100,000 a year income, though, or whatever they get, for tearing people's bodies apart and doing nothing but ministering fear to them all their life. I mean, that's a lot to get paid for destroying people and ministering fear to them. But you see, a doctor by his profession has to be negative rather than positive to keep you coming back. Because if you go in for a checkup and nothing's really wrong, then they'll invent something that's wrong with you. Well, your blood pressure has is, is gone a little bit high this time. And he didn't know that you jogged to the doctor's office to get there. That's why your blood pressure is a little high there. But they'll find something that's wrong with you to keep you coming back next time. But you see, this ought not to be, friends, when God has made us all these promises in his word concerning divine healing. Now, I've been in denominational churches, the first place I ever preached before. I preached this whole series, all seven messages, in an hour and 15 minutes, and it was in a cold water Baptist church, and I got cold water thrown in my face there after I preached for an hour and 15 minutes on the promises of God, how to base positive faith on the positive promises of God. And I had whole rows get up and leave on me. Looked like the building was on fire. This section back here. <laughs> but I had, I had two guesses while they were leaving. Either the Super Bowl was on or the duck in the oven was burning. One of those two things is probably why they were getting up. Underlying cause being he's preaching too long, though. An hour and 15 minutes, I mean. You can't preach an hour and 15 minutes in any church in this country and get away with it and be asked back there the second time. That's why I've never been asked back anywhere. I preached in Pentecostal churches and let the time get away in an hour and a half. One place I preached around an hour and 45 minutes. And <laughs> I know why they have to resort to those techniques of kicking the leg. They gotta keep those people awake there. Because you look out there and everyone's just Falling Z's because you've been up there for an hour and 45 minutes. When is this fella ever going to shut up so I can go home and get a peaceful night's sleep? One place I remember this was in a home meeting and I was preaching on, what was I preaching on? I was preaching on Romans 8, 37, that uh, we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. And I, I talked for a solid two hours, never took a break, talking for a solid two hours just on Romans 8 and verse 37. And we were at a home meeting, so there you've got couches and chairs. And those people were just... <laughs> I mean, it's just the grace of God to preach in places like that. See, around here, you've read Acts 20. Paul preached all night till the breaking of the day, so we don't have to apologize for preaching too long. But, I mean, you lose people. You lose them after 15 minutes. I mean, uh, you, don't, you don't do a magic show or an object lesson for them in the first 15 minutes, and you've lost them. I mean, uh, you have to learn to shut up after 15 minutes. That's all they can handle. They come in with a little symbol, and it's filled up in five minutes, and that's it. I mean, you people have to learn to bring in more than a symbol. You've got to bring in a whole bucket. It takes a long time to fill a bucket up then. They bring me in with that little old denominational symbol. Oh, all I can take is about five minutes of Sunday school lesson. And you get through with your hour and 45 minutes preaching, and well, like I said, that's why we never, never have gotten invited back to the same place twice. 
because I guess we got long-winded in those places. And to tell you the honest truth, uh, I didn't mean to. Just that hour, two hours, teaching on the Word of God, I mean, it just goes by just like that. Maybe it doesn't go by for you like that, I don't know. It goes by for me. You'd be up here two hours teaching on Romans 8, 37. And I was just ready to keep on going, but they said it was time for a coffee break then. So uh, we had to take our break. We never did get back to preaching anymore. They lived on a farm, so they did give us two dozen eggs for our trip down there. <laughs> Thing is, though, I was raised in the city, and I don't like those eggs right when they come out of the chicken. They look funny, you know. <laughs> His sister over here tried to give us some of her eggs, and uh, I don't know. I hate to take the egg right when it comes out of the chicken. I like it to do something before I eat it. <laughs> you have to eat one of them. I guess that you up here in Minnesota, maybe you've been raised on a farm, and you know it just looks funny and it tastes funny. So I've gotten used to it the other way. So don't anyone bring me any of your... <laughs> you know, yeah. I just buy them at the supermarket. They're a little bit different there. Let that chicken keep her eggs there herself. <laughs> we better get off that subject. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. You just try it then. Chicken came first. My mom never did like to eat chicken because she was raised where she actually watched them strangle them to death in the backyard. So she never did like chicken too much after that. They'd go out there and grab the neck and wring it and pull the feathers off and there's that bird with his hide on there. And uh, for a weak stomach, I guess that would about kill the appetite there. <laughs> Now, that doesn't bother me. I mean, I like wild game, and that's just as wild as you get. So don't criticize me if I don't like eggs. I bet I could find something you don't like, like catfish. <laughs> Most people up here don't like catfish. <laughs> we never plan it to, cut, to end up this way. Romans chapter 4. We need to go over to Romans chapter 4. I want to give you a good scriptural example here of someone who knew how to put these principles into practice in their life. Because I want you to see that it's not dishonest to go around saying that you have what God says that you have in his work. As a matter of fact, friends, it's dishonest to say that you don't have what he says that you do have in your work, in his word. That's what's dishonest. I'm not dishonest when I say by his stripes I'm healed and I don't look or feel or sound healed. I'm not the one dishonest. The person's dishonest who says I am not healed when the word of God says by his stripes he were healed. Now they're the ones who are dishonest, not myself, not you, not if you're confessing something positive based on the word of God. You're not the one that's dishonest, they're the ones who are dishonest. It's because they don't know what God has promised them in his word. They don't know what God has said they can have in his word. But here's one man who did know that he could have something because God had promised it to him. And that's the father of faith, faithful Abraham. Romans 4 and verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. Even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's the type of God we're talking about. The one who calleth those things which be not as though they were. We're not off the deep end to say that you can go around confessing that by his stripes you were healed when you've got that growth just as ugly as ever still on your face. Still growing right there on the side of your neck. He's the God that calleth those things which be not. Looks like you don't have your healing as though they were. Now, if he's the God that does that, 
and he gives us the right, the privilege, and I can say the responsibility to go around saying the same thing, that my God is the one who calls those things which be not as though they were. I know I don't have it yet as far as you can see, but my God is the one who calls those things which be not as though they were. That's how I got my first tape player, claimed a $50 tape player, and I just went around confessing it, and I had it in a month. The first suit I ever got by faith, I got the same way. I claimed it and confessed it one afternoon at 2.30 and didn't tell anyone and named what color, exactly what I wanted to have, and I had it by 7.30 that night. I mean, didn't even have to wait the next day. I claimed it that afternoon, 2.30 in the afternoon. Someone brought it to me, 7.30, five hours, isn't that fun? Five hours later, had it by faith. I mean, he tells us we can do these things in his work. I'm not the one. This isn't my, you know, new doctrine I've invented to go around and, and gain friends and influence people. This is the word of God. He calleth those things which be not as though they were. And he gives us the right to do the same thing. This is how I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Someone over our house the other day, just this past week, talking to them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you speak in tongues? No. Do you have the baptism? No. I begged and begged God for that, and he just chose not to give it to me. Well, the Bible doesn't say, beg and you shall receive. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive, Matthew 7, 7. Matthew 7, 8, for everyone that beggeth, no, for everyone that asketh, receive it. All that I asked and didn't receive. Well, then you just made God a liar. He said, if you ask, you will receive just that you didn't ask in faith and you didn't know that you didn't ask in faith. Everyone that asketh, and we can put the other conditions, Mark 11, 24, Matthew 21, 22, in faith, everyone that asketh in faith received it. That's how simple it is. And this is how I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People had told me before I had to do these tearing and waiting and these different gymnastics to receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, someone told me, if you confess that you believe you have received, then God will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That's how I got the baptism, August the 3rd, 1975. I prayed the simple prayer and asked the Father to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And then I confessed. I said, Father, I thank you that I've got it now in Jesus' name. Now, did I speak in tongues at that instant? No. But I did the next instant, though. And I tried many times before to receive. But you see, as I said, it's not by trying. It's by believing. And you can just try, 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 hope, 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 fast, fast, wish, wish, call, telephone, telephone, telephone to prayer partners, and you still won't ever get it. Everyone that asketh in faith, receive it. So I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was ninety years old at the time. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, what do we, ha what do we have here in the beginning of verse 19? He was not weak in faith, first of all, Secondly, he considered not his own body. Jonah chapter 2. He says that Jonah chapter 2, Jonah praying there in the whale's belly, he said, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Jonah chapter 2. Lying vanities. Because here Abraham's body, friends, he's a century old. And you couldn't find a professing Christian in a hundred million. That's 18 years old. If the doctor told him it was barren, that God would give him a child supernaturally. And here's the man a century old. 
and his wife's 90. And not only is she 90 and barren, but she's been barren for the 90 years. It's not that she produced at one time and became barren later. She's been barren for all of her 90 years. And he's a century old. But what did God tell him when he was 75? I'm going to give you a son. What does he have to do? Well, these are the steps there. Couldn't be weak in faith. He couldn't consider his own body. You can't consider the circumstances that are around. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. God had given him a promise. You can't stagger at those promises like a drunkard. Back and forth, James 1, up and down, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind and wave of doctrine. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. And here's that phrase again, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. That's Numbers 23, 19. God's not a man, friends, that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? I mean, God's not going to say something that he can't do or that he's not going to do. If you'll continue to give a consistent, positive confession based upon the word of God, then he's told us in Romans 10 and verse 10, with the heart you believe for whatever it is you're going to receive, but with the mouth confession is made into possession. Romans 10, 10. With the heart you believe, with the mouth you confess. This is just the way God has set it up. And he's not going to let you get anything from him by faith any other way. Since he's the one who set it up this way, and he wants you to confess that you believe that you have received before you see it. You know why? It's because confession is faith's way of expressing itself. That's your faith talking. We can't see your faith there, but that's your faith talking. That's Matthew 12 and verse, what, 34? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You have an abundance of faith in your heart, then we are going to hear an abundance of confession of faith for whatever it is you desire. We don't hear that confession. Matthew 12, 34 says there's no faith there. That's how important this is. This is faith's way of expressing itself. Don't, you don't have to be considered strange. You don't have to consider yourself strange or, or a fool to go around confessing that you believe you have received to all your neighbors and all those that doesn't matter whether they understand or not. God gives you the right to go around confessing that you believe you have received. I mean, there Noah is in Genesis chapter 6 through 8, 120 years confessing God's going to send a flood. Well, he didn't do it in his prayer closet either. I mean, he probably did it there, but he did it el other places too. And that is before people. Matthew 10, confession of salvation must be before men if you want him to confess you before the Father. Now, we've got two extremes here that come to mind that I'll share with you right now. We've got some people who come to church and, oh, they're the first ones to give that bold confession. I believe that I have received my healing. I believe my wife, my husband is home, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. As soon as they get home, in their prayer closet, moaning and groaning and complaining, God, it's, it's been two years now. I mean, what's wrong? It's been two years, and I just don't know how much longer I can hang on. There's one person, they'll confess out here publicly to us that they believe they received. They go home to God and confess just the opposite. But then we've got someone else who, whenever they go home in their closet, they'll confess they've got it, but whenever they're around relatives, employers, friends, neighbors, they wouldn't dare say something as foolish as, I believe that I'm healed. <coughs> I believe that I'm healed. I mean, you get the point? They wouldn't dare do something like that. Why? Because they're afraid of men. There's no faith in their heart, and therefore they can't come out with a positive confession. 
You watch yourself. Oh, you'd tell me. I mean, you wouldn't dare be caught around here with a negative confession. You'd get hung if we caught you with a negative confession around here. But then your neighbor, well, how are you feeling today? I just won't say anything. I'll be a silent witness for Christ today. <laughs> and guess who's in heaven being a silent witness for you at the same time? I don't want to tell my neighbor that. They won't understand. I'm sure that the whole world didn't understand Noah in his day. He went ahead and said it anyway. God's sending a flood. We're told in 2 Peter, uh, what, chapter 2? He was a preacher of righteousness. Went around preaching Got to get saved, repent and be saved. Well, why? God's going to send a flood and destroy all of you wicked men. They've never even seen it rain before. A flood, what's that? It's when a lot of water comes and you're all going to drown. Drowning, what's that? Talking about someone that didn't understand, they couldn't understand what he was saying. He went around telling them anyway. Abraham has to go around calling himself, the last year of his life, Abraham a father of many nations. And he didn't have any children. None from Sarah. And when he had walked up to someone, what's your name? My name is a father of many nations. That's what Abraham means. My, my name is a father of a multitude. Well, where are they? I got him by faith. You got him by faith. What in the world does that mean? You do have to explain these things to people because if you tell someone I've got it by faith, well, they don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about pastors. You got it by faith. Well, what does that mean? They don't understand what it means. Well, it means just what it means. It means Romans 4, 17 to 22. You have to believe that God is the one who calls those things which be not as though they were. Now, I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 22. And this is, I believe, a chapter later in Abraham's life. We had gotten his faith child in chapter 21. And then in chapter 22, he's required to do something drastic here. But I want you to see he's still making a positive confession here about his son. Genesis 22 and verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did try Abraham. James 1, God tempts no man. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son. I mean, God really says it all here. Thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now watch what he says in verse 5. Here is his confession of faith. Then Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. What a confession. He had it by means of direct revelation of God that he was going to offer his son up a burnt sacrifice. We come to verse 5. He says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and we. I mean, that's the verb. We in come. We will come again to you. That's his faith speaking. God had told him he's going to offer him up for a sacrifice. He said, wait here. Isaac and I are going over there and we'll be back in a little while. And he knew what God had told him to do when he got there. Isaac said, verse 7, My father, Abraham said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Confessing his faith. Confessing his faith. He didn't say he'd provide you for the offering. 
he said he will provide a lamb for the offering. This is what you call a bold faith. When it looks, friends, like God has told him to do something that he can't possibly get around. This is what you really call a bold faith. I mean, we're giving you positive promises that say that you can have these things. Here was a time where God said, no, you can't have your son. Want him for a burnt sacrifice. Want him for an offering. I mean, that, if anything, would be much more difficult to believe for. When God said, no, it's the same thing in Matthew 15 and Mark 7 with the Syrophoenician woman. No, no, no. He finally gave her a yes. No here. Abraham's confessing already once. We'll come again. He's confessing in verse 8. God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Then, of course, you know the story. Sure enough, God provides the lamb. And as a result, we have this monumental verse. That's verse 14 that you ought to be familiar with. And Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Jireh. As it is said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. One of his covenant compound names. Yahweh Jireh, what does that mean? It means God will provide. And that's what you have to say to someone. Well, do you have anything? Yahweh Jireh. Yahweh Jireh. God is the one who provides. Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh Jireh. As it is said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Seems a bad translation. I mean, what did they get there? They got a lamb just seen? Well, that wouldn't have done them any good. They got a lamb provided for the sacrifice. Therefore, we know that we can have the same type of assurance by confessing this. In the mount of the Lord, that is after you've gone through whatever particular trial it is, that's his trial here on Mount Moriah, after you've gone through the trial, then it shall be provided. Whatever it is that you've claimed that God has promised you in his word.